So somebody was asking me if I can show more examples of how you use modules. The idea is the same thing. So if I have talk.py and I want another program, Python program to use that talk.py, I put that program in the same directory and inside that a.py, I simply say import talk. It will find the talk that's in the current directory and then use it just like you do it in a standard interpreter. That's all there is to it. It's not very complicated. Spoke about namespaces, the fact that they are simply mappings from names to objects. We looked at exceptions, how you can, what kind of exceptions are generated and how you can catch them and take necessary action and raise your own exceptions. Thing I didn't mention was exceptions are basically you can create new exceptions of your own by subclassing exception. There's an exception it's a class. So you can actually create it's a type actually. You can subclass this and create your own exception. Okay, but we're not going to do it in this. I think the tutorial and the Python documentation has more detail on this. Okay, so let's get to classes. So what's the big picture of classes as follows? The main thing is you lets you create new data types. So basically a class is a template in order to create objects of that particular class. So think of it as the blueprint that makes you your Honda Accord. That notion of what defines a Honda Accord as against the Honda Accord itself. Okay, so that's what a class is. So it's like a template. Please note that in Python, a class is also an object. So it has properties and has behavior. So when you create a class, it's just another object. The only thing about that object is when you call that object, it creates an instance. That's pretty much it. Instantiating a class, which is what I was saying as call that object, creates the instance, which is another object. And the instance encapsulates the state and the behavior of that particular object. So basically, Classes, in addition to just doing this, letting you create objects, also let you define what's called um, an inheritance hierarchy. So let's say you're defining, you're creating something like uh, a management tool for automobiles, for the automobile industry. So you likely, you'll say that there exists an abstract thing called an automobile. And the automobile has the following properties. It has this much power output, it has this rating, it has this fuel, it has so many wheels, number of wheels. You're basically saying that here is an object that has certain properties. You're vague about it, but you're saying that it does have some of these properties. For example, even in uh, biology, you classify the entire, uh, all living beings into various types. And there's a hierarchy. So a human being is a mammal. Okay, so you have what's called an ease A relationship. So a Honda car is a car. A car is not a Honda car. A car is a general thing. A Honda car is a specific thing. I don't know why I picked Honda car. but uh, A car is an automobile. So a Honda car is also an automobile. So you have a hierarchy. Honda car, car, automobile, a means of transport. Or you can just go up, an object. So you can actually go up and build a hierarchy. And the beauty is each thing, so if you say a car, a car has certain properties. And once you define those properties, they're done. You don't have to redefine those properties for a Honda car or for a, a Maruti car. You don't have to do it because they both inherit from the car class. So with classes, you can actually create that inheritance tree. So again, it's about code reuse. The same way a Python is a reptile. The crocodile is a reptile. So basically, there's a notion of is a relationship. This is very important in you know, inheritance hierarchy. The other thing about classes and object-oriented programming in general is that 
you need to think object oriented. You have to change the way you think. So it takes some getting used to when you write OO code. So you have to resolve everything into objects that are interacting. It's not hard and once you start doing it, it becomes a habit to the point that you start talking always in object oriented form. But it's extremely powerful because it really lets you create. Um, so what's the big deal? The big deal is it lets you create objects that mimic a real problem that's being simulated. So imagine, for example, you're solving some tracking of particles. So instead of saying, I have this array which has the x position, this array that has the y position, this array that has the z position, and then you have a function that somehow manipulates these. You instead say, I have points. I create a point object. I have an array of point objects. And now I track these points. So you're talking in terms of points in your physical reality. And in your code, you're doing the same thing. I have for some points, I have a list of points. And these points are moved. So you have a function that says move. Then you say move and the move is given a list of points. Right? So the point is when you write code, you start writing code that sounds like what you're actually talking about. And this makes life very easy. It makes problem solving more natural. It makes it much more elegant. You can communicate these ideas much easier. And it's a lot easier to create the code because you can think in this clear, well separated notion. This is an object, it does this. This object does this. This is how these two objects interact. It allows for phenomenal amount of code reuse when done properly. And all of this goes without saying. If you do inheritance badly, if you say, if you have a class inheritance hierarchy which says where a Honda car derives from uh, a watch, it's stupid. And you start doing things like this, you get into difficulties. But the instant you say a Honda car is a watch, you realize, oh, that's wrong. So the, again, the point is the reality of the situation is directly represented in the code. So you just say it out loud, a Honda car is a class. No, that's wrong. Is a Honda car is a watch. That's wrong. A Honda car is a car. Yes, that's right. So the language forces you to think in a particular way that's structured the way we normally think. So it makes code easier to create, easier to understand, and it allows for code reuse. The reason is your car class defines everything for the car. Only the specifics of the Honda car will be defined in the Honda class. Therefore, code is reused. The Maruti car uses the same one bit of code that's done by the car. Only one thing changes. We'll see examples of this. The other thing is polymorphism, which means depending on what the object is, the specifics of that object will be different. So in Python, how do you create a class? Syntax is as follows. You say class, some name, bracket, object, or multiple number of objects. The thing inside the bracket is what you are subclassing from. And usually, there's an object in Python called object which is the base for all objects. Okay? So I can say class A object pass. So notice the use of pass here. Syntactically, I have to do something. I put a colon out there in the previous line, indent saying that there's going to be a block following here with some code. I don't want to do anything right now, so I put a pass. So now I can instantiate this class A by saying now a is a main dot a, this is defined in the namespace main, is an object. And a itself is a class. Is that clear? In this case, a has this, okay, so let's see. A has a bunch of uh, attributes. One of them is class. It also has a doc string which is the documentation, which I have not written, and a bunch of other things which I am going to ignore for the time being. So a dot class is the original class, which is this. So a itself has, say, name. It also has other attributes like bases, which are the base classes. So in this case, I derived a from object. So the base class for A is object. Do you know, is everybody familiar with base classes? How many of you don't understand what a base class is? Okay, just 
okay few okay so in an, i said there is an object hierarchy so we said honda car car automobile so automobile is like a base class from which car is derived from which honda car is derived is that clear so basically it, that is a relationship a man is a mammal so mammal is like a base class the base on top of which you have a derived class called man is that fine so same way here a has a base class called an object which is a generic thing in python everything pretty much is derived from ultimately from okay so in this case when i do a i said a is so i defined a class by just doing this and instantiated an object of that class as a equals capital a open bracket close bracket a has an attribute called class which is the class of which it is an instance the class itself so a dot class a dot class dot basis okay now the reason you have basis is you can also have what's called multiple inheritance i am a man but i am also an indian so i can have two inheritance okay but in general in the multiple inheritance is a bit of a problem because when you implement things you have to be very careful so i would recommend that unless you really are familiar with classes don't mess with multiple inheritance python supports multiple inheritance java does not so you can do it but do it with care so now this f the object here foo is just another object and in python this is something i never mentioned i can create an attribute of something by sticking it into it so i can say a dot some junk so i can set an attribute inside that instance now if i create b is a b dot junk is a name error attribute error sorry there is no attribute that this object has but b a dot junk does work okay so basically it's just an object i've just created a simple object now let's get more complex so in some more details all attributes are accessed via object dot attribute just like strings and lists the same notion object dot attribute both class and instant attributes are supported which means as i said a class is also a first class object a class this a is a class it's not an instance but i can say a dot junk that's fine it's just an object and now if i say b dot junk i don't know if this will works because it's going and looking at the class and now if i create a c it's still 100 so i can create something that's common across all class instances by sticking that in the class itself so these are called in c++ they called static okay they called static uh, member static members right static variables in a class so in python you can do that but you can also do it at the instance level as we saw if i did a dot junk it does not go to any other instance um methods or the next thing which we we'll look at are what give behavior to an object so we have just looked at attributes we created a simple object we gave it we can set attributes into it <coughs> and a method basically represents the behavior of the object so crudely think of them as functions that belong to the object so we'll look at an example so think of this example my class derived from an object colon documentation string for the class a class attribute and then i define a function f <coughs> which returns hello world notice that the function has a first argument as self okay so we'll come back to this in a bit but typically a method in a class has the first argument set to self so let's run this example
this is the code. I imagine I just typed it out. So I say talk dot my class dot i. That's one two three four five, which I sent. Now let's create an instance. I say a is talk dot. Notice that I'm using a module. Is just I would have typed it here, but it's nice conveniently sitting in my talk dot py. I'm just instantiating it from there. There's no difference. I've just introduced the notion of a namespace there. So I'm creating an instance of this class. Now I have a, which is talk dot my class object. Now I can say a dot f. Note that I give you no arguments. I just hit enter, and it returns hello world. Okay. So that's precisely what we have done here. Now notice, I can also do this as talk dot my class dot f a. It does the same thing. So basically, a fun a method is like a function where if called from the instance, a the instance itself is the first argument. So I had self here, right? F self colon. I called a dot f as a dot f. I did not pass self to it. I did not pass any argument to that. If I wrote a function f self, it's legal. There is no keyword called self. Now if I say f, it's an error. Because I have not passed it an argument, but if I say f one, it works. But for a dot f, it didn't happen. What is a dot f? This is the function. So it has a self, but that self is not explicitly specified. So this is something that's automatically done. If it's an instance, a is an instance of my class. Talk dot my class. If it's an instance, when it is called, when a method is called, that instance is passed as the first argument. Always. But if I called this guy, talk dot my class dot f, it is not bound to instance. It is the talks my class is f. So he has no idea who f is. So if I call this without any arguments, it will say unbound method f. Must be called with my class instance as first argument. So, in order to sum up, this is what is happening. When you create a class definition, like here, a method there is just like a function, except it's given the first argument as self. This, when you create an instance, this a here of my class. A is an instance of my class, and a dot f is called a bound method. A bound method is bound to a particular instance, and every time you call this bound method, the first argument to that bound method is the instance itself. Now, this bound method is also a first class object, so I can say junk equals a dot f. No problems. How do I call junk now? What is junk? It's that same thing because junk is now a name that is a reference to a bound object a dot f. So how do I call junk? That's it. So when you create a class, you can set instance attributes. Class attributes. You create a function there. The first argument to that function is self, which is a convention. You could have called it self x, for example. That self becomes the instance that you are calling it for an instance. So when you instantiate my class, a dot f is a bound method that is bound to a, such that when you call a dot f, the first argument is this is the instance itself. So now inside f, for example, class a object, def create some data, self 
and I can say self dot data equals list. Now I say a a dot data is an error. I have not created the data. Now I say a dot create data. A dot data is this list. Now if I had b is a, b does not have data. So self is conventionally the first argument for a method, for a bound method. Okay, it's convention. You could define it as def f x, no problem. But then lot of people are going to curse you because it's not a convention. In the previous example, a dot f is a method object. In this particular case, it's a bound method object. Okay. When a dot f is called, it is passed the instance a as the first argument by default, and you don't have to call it. It's, it's done for you. There are a bunch of special methods which let you do things on construction and on destruction and various other times. So I have only highlighted the one at construction time. So there is a method called underscore underscore init underscore underscore. If that method exists, when you say A is my class, that method would be called. Same way when it destructs, when the object is garbage collected, a del method will be called. Um, there are other special methods by convention like underscore underscore add underscore underscore self comma object which will let you add two numbers let add, add two objects of the same type so if you say I create a matrix a class matrix object I can define an add self comma another matrix then I return a matrix from there which is the sum of these two matrices you can do all of these things so you can add subtract divide multiply you can check for is something in this. So if you have a container object, you can create a method called contains. These conventions are defined in these documents. So just visit them. They describe exactly what you need to do. So here's a concrete example of how you create an object with instance attributes with a constructor. Created a bag which derives from my class. So notice my class is this which has a function f already defined which returns hello world. So bag now has an init and first argument is self. So when I say a is equal to bag, this method gets called which means a dot data is set. Is that clear? So when the object is created first time, the init method is by default called. So there are a bunch of defaults you have to remember. For a bound method, the instance is passed as the first argument, that's self. So we are done with that. When you create an instance, if there is an init method, the init is called. You can do anything you want in that init. You can create variables, you can create new objects, delete other objects, do whatever you want. It's just another function. But usually it's used to create any instance attributes you want. Okay. Then you define any functions that you want like here add, add twice, so on and so forth. Now you instantiate this object by saying a is bag. a dot f will call what? I have not defined f here. So how does it call a dot f? The second line here is a dot f. This is an inherited method. So it's defined over here. So it will return hello world. Now I can say a dot add one. So it will add to data one. It will append. So the, this is just normal Python code. The only thing is if it's an inherited method, you use self. So you say self dot this, self dot that. Then other method here. So here we see that add one, add twice. I end up with a's data being one, two, two. So that's it. So this is how you create and you can create as many as you want. Now supposing I want to derive from bag another bag. You have to be careful. You have to make sure that in another bags in it, supposing you want to do something special in another bag. So let's say bag has data. In another bag, I want more data. Okay, here. So you create an init for another bag. 
you must call the parents in it. So in C++, this is done automatically. In Python, it is not. So you have to remember to call bag.init self. And here you are calling the unbound function. You are not calling a bound function. You are saying explicitly, this is the parent class, call this. The parent class, if he has an init, he would have called the other. So it will keep going up and initialize everything that needs to be initialized. So basically, when you do that, you have the object say state set up exactly as how the parent has done it. And now you are free to do anything else. So you can say self dot more data is something else, no problems. Now instead of doing this parent call, there is a way to call it using what is called super. So getting back here, let's recap. You create a class definition, it creates a class object, my class. Class object is any object, so it has methods and attributes. Like here, this is an attribute, this is a method, it is an unbound method. You instantiate a class to get an object of that class. And then when you call an instance object, you say a dot f, self is passed automatically. The instance is passed automatically and it becomes the first argument. If a method called init exists, it is a constructor. So at construction time, it is called. Please note that init is just a normal function. It is just a name in it. So you can have arguments, keyword arguments, multiple arguments, arbitrary arguments, no problems. It is just a function. Similarly with del, and there are other special methods that I would suggest you look at these documents about. For inheritance, you need to make sure that if your parent class has an init, that you call it. And define any derived functions, you can derive any functions. Now the thing that is important in Python is, all methods in Python are virtual. In C++, you have to explicitly say something is virtual. So if you do not know C++, you do not know virtual functions, forget about what I said. Okay? Basically, when you say a dot f, it is going to call the function of a, called f. That is it. You inherit through subclassing, multiple inheritance is supported. To answer your question, there is no special public and private attributes. There are only good conventions. So usually when you say object dot public, this object dot attribute without a leading underscore like here, it is a public method. If it has a leading underscore, it is usually a non-public method. It is a private method. This is a convention. Okay? So if you see something with an underscore and you are accessing it, you really have no business accessing it. You are being bad. Okay. So the last thing is polymorphism. So what is the big deal about polymorphism? I did not say anything about it. So let us say I have a class called drawable, which derives some object. This drawable object just draws. It has one method which says draw. Drawable really is not anything. It is a draw. It is like a car. There is no car. There is only a specific car. So I am talking of a generic drawable object. What does a generic drawable object do? It draws. So I create a method called draw. Now I want to now say I want to create a real thing that can draw itself. So I say a square. So I do, I write some code here to say drawing a square. I do a circle and it also does, it draws a circle. Now I want to create an artist that can take, it is also a drawable which draws but which has a collection of various things that are drawable. So now let us say, I will show you the real code, this is just some pseudo code. If the artist has a draw method, he will simply take all the drawables that he contains. So, so the artist can have a list of drawables. So I can simply say for object in, for drawable in self dot drawables, in my drawables, draw, draw the object. So I will just show you a quick example. So talk, okay. So drawable is just what we saw, square just prints draw square, circle prints draw circle and artist takes this, notice the arguments here, it takes self and star args, star args is what, multiple arguments in the form of a tuple. So I convert that to a list and say self dot drawables equals list of args. Now, when I draw the artist, 
it will just draw everything inside it. So, let us try this. So, I say C is talk dot circle, uh, square is talk dot square. So, I say C dot draw, draw circle, S dot square will draw square. So, I say A is talk dot artist and now I want to pass it any number of things. I could pass it nothing, but I would like, I'd like to pass it the circle and the square. Now, I say A dot draw, it is as simple as that. So, now I have depending on what this object is, it is actually going to call either draw square or draw, I do not have to worry is this this type, is that that type, no worries. I just create objects and let them do their thing. So, you can imagine that if you are creating something very complicated, that you can actually generate very simple looking code that does a lot and that does a lot in an intuitive manner. Okay? That is what polymorphism is all about. First thing is how do you create standalone scripts? We have just talked about everything on the Python shell. I want to be able to create a script that can be run. The way to do it is, so you do whatever you do in a module, you create your functions, do whatever and then you check if we are running standalone as a module. So, when imported name will not be main. So, if I am running the program directly by saying python talk.py, the name will be main. So, if we are being executed, you execute this block. Is that clear? So, as an example, if I do python talk.py, it prints this some list and does something. So, if I now go back, it did not print anything. I imported the code, but it did not do anything. The reason is, I defined this is just a normal module. Over here, I said if name is main, do something. So, when it is executed explicitly, name becomes main and then you can do what you want. So, that is how you create standalone scripts. The only other thing is the first line of your source code will have something that looks like this, which basically tells Unix that if you see a script like this, you interpret the contents of the script using Python. That is all, no magic to it. One very handy feature is called list comprehensions. Let us say I have wedges tomato, carrot. I am going to simplify it, do not have much time. Now, I want to create a new list containing each of these with an upper. How will I do it? One way is doing v is empty list, then I say for x in wedge, v dot append uh, x dot upper. Right? Upper is a string method each x becomes tomato or carrot and I am appending that to the empty list. V is this, but this is like four lines of code. With list comprehensions, I can say V is x dot upper for x in wedge. Boom, done. Ah. What is the error? I did not call the method. I just said V dot upper. Right? So, if you ignore my errors, it is just one line of code. So, x dot upper for x in wedge gives you this. Same way if you look at, I created a range object. So, what will this be? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, not 8. I find all the even values like this with one line. I can find all the odd, I can, I can print the square of the even values like this. I can do this. And now I can do a two way for loop. I can say x y for x in even for y in odd. So, basically here the only new thing that is introduced is the if block here. So, for x for vec for x in vec if x percentage 2 is 0, what does x percentage do? It is yes. So, if, the, if it perfectly divides the, div the, the if the remainder is 0, it is even, that is it. So, it is a very convenient shorthand and it is very efficient also. It is done in C underneath. So, it is very, very efficient. So, I have listed out a bunch of very useful IPython features. 
and this is kind of verbose it is meaningless for me to sort of drone about each of these so it is there in your printed slides and it is also there in the PDFs so look at these and experiment with these when you are on an IPython session okay so basically IPython supports input and output caching which means all the tough stuff you have typed in is stored all the stuff that it outputs is stored inputs are in in capital I n so if I say for example in it has all the inputs same way out will have all the outputs underscore double underscore and triple underscore are the last three variables that were outputted you can get the history of what you have typed I can say hist minus n without the line so now we can cut paste this and stick it in a file you can log your entire session which means if as you type it is actually saving it to a file by using log start log on and log off run has several when you do run so for example if I do it executed talk.py now if I do run minus d and break point at something it will actually run that under the debug so it is extremely handy which means I say I want to stop at line number 40 on this script so it will go there stop there and it will run your code under the debugger and give you a debugger session you can inspect variables play around and stuff um, there is a variable called pdb so if you make a mistake in your code and you do run and you have pdb on it will actually go and put the debugger at the error point ok so I'll, if you want I will show you a demo so def So when I import it there are no errors. Now if I say talk dot test it gives me an error but I want to go to that location in the error so I just say pdb automatic pdb has been turned on and now if I do talk dot test it gives me a debugger prompt where I can actually type and see what is nonsense. So it says name error I can figure out the error here. Now I, I have python and I have the power of python I can introspect check values do stuff and the interpreter. Um, you can do profiling of a script with run minus p which means what is profiling familiar with profiling. Profiling basically tells you which part of the code is executing how long. So if you want to do a time analysis saying okay where is my function why is it so slow it will actually tell you give you information on where it is slow where it is fast you can go in and then speed up those functions um, time will time the script so it will tell you how how fast the script uh, how long did it take to run you can record macros which means if you run of five five lines and you see you are keeping on repeating those five lines plot this get this change this you record a macro and you can type the macro name it will execute those five lines then you can use an edit so if you want to edit source code from python you can say edit so I suggest for more help <coughs> supposing there is something like you do a question mark ipython will tell you about something there is a macro you want to learn how to use a macro type it put a question mark it will tell you what, <coughs> what to do you can change directories so you say cd something it will change to that directory <coughs> you can access the shell I, I think I did this I did echo something so bang command runs a shell command and returns it output <coughs> you can grab the output of the out command you ran um, you can use bookmarks which are very neat so I can say cd to some directory and then say bookmark some name the next time I do not have to type that long directory name I can say cd that bookmark name it will go there ok so long as there is no conflict with an existing directory with the same name ok if you really want only to use the bookmark you say book cd minus b then it will only go to the bookmark directory so basically it is extremely convenient supposing you, you have typed a lot of stuff and you want to save that to a file very useful you did a lot of experimenting 
and you want to save all of that, you can say save lines file name or save file name lines, it will save it. And for more help, just type percentage magic. All these commands are magics. It will tell you all the existing magic functions and give you plenty of documentation on each. Okay, file handling, again fairly straightforward. If you want to read a file, a text file, you simply say open name of the file name. The method read will read all of that content of the file into a string and return it. The read line function will keep on reading one individual line at a time. Read lines will read the entire thing as a set of lines. So let's just try this. Open I am going to open the talk file. So f dot read ooh, gives me all of this. It is a string. So I can say underscore is the last variable. I did not save that. So but underscore was it's there. It is printing the code. That is the code. So I now again say f is open. I finished reading the file. I am going to reread it. f is open talk. So f dot read line prints the first line. So it can keep on doing this. But then I can say lines is f dot read lines. Oops. It is a list. So the tenth line is print this, this particular line. So you can read all the lines. Further, files support iteration. So you can say for line in file. So if I say f print line it works um, you close a file explicitly by saying f dot close it is a good idea to always do that and then you cannot read the file anymore there are other methods like tell which means you can move to a particular byte in the file seek things like that you can write files same thing the last argument you pass as w default argument for this is read if you want to write a file, you just put a w, you can create a file. So if I did it for talk.py, my talk.py is gone. So I am not going to do it. But you can do it and to write, you just explicitly pass it strings. f dot write the string, the string, the string. And you have to explicitly put new lines. So if you want a new line, you put a slash. In. Math module, we are going to do a lot more math, but there is a mo module called math. So say import math. See, I can't do square root here. There is no square root. But math defines square root. So I can say math dot square root, math dot pi, so on and so forth. So again, you do math dot tab and find out, figure out for yourself what there is. These are basically real, real valued math functions. C math gives you complex value. So if you have complex numbers, you want logarithm of a complex number, CMath defines it. There is a random module, it is not a, it's not a random module, but it is a, ra it's a module that gives you random numbers um, and it is a very good random number generator. But these basic modules, math, CMath and random are default, they are always there. So any Python installation you can find these, so they are convenient. When you want a time, so another thing that you need to do often, you want to time your code. You can use the time module. Time.clock will give you the current clock. You run some instructions, time.clock again you get something. The next time, the difference of the two is the wall clock that's elapsed. But I find that IPython is the most convenient way to do this. You use IPython's time and time it macros or magics. Same way you can use IPython's run minus p to do a profile. Bunch of odds and ends, there is a built in called dir. So given any object, it will give you um, the attributes of a given object or the attributes that are available in the current namespace. So if I type dir, oops, I get all of the variables that are currently available in the namespace. If I do dir on math, 
it will give me all the attributes in math. Okay. So, it is a generally useful method. The built in called type, it is another function when given an object will give you the type of that object. So, if I say type, I hope A is, okay, there is no A, A is A is a string. So, if I say type A, it will tell me type string. STR and REPR basically if you are given an object, if you do STR of the object, it will convert it to a nice string form. There are methods called is instead, is instance and is subclass. So, if I take so I am going to instantiate a class. Okay. Remember that bag is subclass from my class, another bag is subclass from bag. So, I can now ask the question is instance, so is instance A my class, is it an instance of my class? Yes, it is because it is another bag is derived from bag which is derived from my class. There are there is another statement called assert, read it up. There are a bunch of useful modules like CSV which let you read up CSV files, you ever need that. Pickle lets you do serialization, I do not think we are going to cover it. And the sys module has something called an argv which gives you the arguments passed to a script. So, if you say import sys and then say sys dot argv, it will give you a list of all the arguments that were passed to that particular script. So, as an example, if you look at talk dot pi, the last lines import sys print sys dot argv. So, if I run python talk dot pi, it prints talk dot pi a list. If I did some arguments I am giving it talk dot pi minus a minus b. So, it gets the arguments and you can actually do processing, you can actually check there are other modules which will let you do command line parsing and you can build a sophisticated command line engine and things like that. Okay. The best place to get more information on documents of various standard modules is the module reference. So, it is again all free available documentation.